I'm Terry Lucas. I'm the library director here. Um, just want to remind you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just want to remind you all that we're considering expanding out the library a little bit. And we'd love to get your opinion. And there's some flyers back in the back that you can look at. We'd love to love to hear from you. We want to know what everybody thinks. So these two gentlemen sitting sitting here probably don't need an introduction, um, but I'm going to say a few words anyway. <laughs> Robert Lipside is a journalist and an author. He's written numerous young adult novels and se several books of nonfiction for adults. He was a sports writer for the New York Times and now is a Shelter Island favorite, writing as the codger for the Shelter Island Reporter. <laughs> Jules Pfeiffer is a Pulitzer Prize winning author and cartoonist, as well as a playwright and a filmmaker. He was born and raised in the Bronx. He wrote his comic strip for the Village Voice for 40 years. He 42. 42. <laughs> he continues to write, recently venturing into the world of graphic novels. And we are so lucky to have these two friends join us tonight so we can eavesdrop on their conversation. Please welcome. Thank you, Terry. Um, Thank you and good night. <laughs> You haven't been called on yet. Um, actually, I, I noticed in Google that you're uh, 93 years old, which means which means that we don't have time to waste. <laughs> right, right to our question. This so, gentleman is also 93. Is that right? Yeah. Only what, what what month? October. October. <laughs> you're way Barely early. Nine months. <laughs> I was born in January. <laughs> the same year Popeye was created, the same month Popeye was created in the same year. I, I'm not impressed. <laughs> I was born in 1938. Well, don't make tears. I was born in 1938, the year Superman. Oh. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, well, what, what was it, 38 or 37? 38. <laughs> Yeah. And the two guys, the two cartoonists, they were good cartoonists. Jerry <laughs> <laughs> uh, Siegel and Joe Schuster. That's right. From Cleveland. Yes, they were 17 years old. Wow. And they couldn't date girls, so they created a superhero. <laughs> and then they could date girls. <laughs> what was your excuse? What was your excuse? What was your excuse? Oh, my excuse. The same as theirs, to get laid. <laughs> and that's why you're still working? <laughs> no, no, the habit of working outlasted the gift of getting laid. <laughs> you know, we didn't, we came here for serious talk. Not, not for this kind of... This is how serious it gets. You can only know. <laughs> not, not for this kind of banter. What I want to know is when you kind of exploded on the scene in the 50s and the 60s, you were fueled... What's last week? You were fueled <laughs> by anger, you told me. Are you still angry? Yes. <laughs> no, I, I have more reason to be angry now if one looks around at the conditions under which we live. But the anger burned out of me a long time ago. So I am um, angry uh, as a matter of form, but actually I'm very happy. <laughs> Don't do something. <laughs> well, how does that affect your work? Who works anymore? <laughs> well, I've seen you pouring over your easel, so I know you do. Well, it's it's it's. Uh, I work. I've been working all, since the age of four, doing what I do. So I just do it. I mean, it's all I know how to do. I never played sports. Uh, I was bad at everything else. The only thing I could do is pretend to draw be, be, even before I knew how to draw. So that's what I did. And then uh, we got into the 50s and the Cold War happened and politics happened. And I got into the business of overthrowing the government. And I succeeded and look what we have now. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> well, do you think things, I mean, you were born the same year as that gentleman there, the depression. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else here was 93? Yeah. He's younger. First of all, he's younger than you. Yeah. And second of all, this is not his show. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, you, you were born in, during the Depression. You came through World War II. You were in the Army during the Korean War, McCarthy, the Cold War. Uh, a, a very bleak time, although it certainly fed your work. And, and did you think? That was a less hopeful time than now? That was a very hopeful time all the way through because it was pre-digitalization and there was a common culture that brought people together and uh, they were uh, uh, before, I mean, in 1929 when I was born, radio went coast to coast for the first time so that people all over the country were listening to the same shows. Uh, they were listening to Jack Benny and Fred Allen and Eddie Cantor and Charlie Mc McCarthy and Edgar Bergen. And, and so there was a, a, a common uh, culture. People laughed at the same things. Uh, in 1929, when I was born, sound came into movies. So people went, a bigger audience went to movies for the first time and the movies uh, well, the common currency that to, with which every, I mean, uh, my religion was Mickey and Judy and Fred and Ginger, and you know, uh, the, 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 what gave me hope and my family hope during the Great Depression was those escapist movies that made us all feel that we were going to dance our way through all of this, and it was all illusion, and the illusion worked. The illusion unified us in some peculiar way, and the culture was unified because of all of these things that met at the same time by action. And the difference today is that uh, unification ended with digitalization and then everything broke down into little pieces and little... So there is no country there. Isn't. We have no there there anymore. Uh, we have a this there. And the this there doesn't unite us, it divides us. You go to any place for dinner, and you see the same family sitting at the table, and what are they doing? They're looking at this. They're not in conversation. They're not, you know, it's, uh, so it's a whole different, and um, uh, an old man's complaint of what, what, what draws us apart. Well, like, what, you know, oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> to ask yourself questions. <laughs> so, so here you are, so you're full of hope, I'm here, here. Yeah. You're my, full, my, full, my. false hope, you're like 15, 20, 25 years old, uh, but your satire had such an edge to it, what made you angry? Uh, it's interesting. The first thing that politicized me, really, I mean, I came from a, a political family. Like I had a sister, an older sister, four years my senior, who was a Stalinist. And <coughs> she was always trying to make a communist out of me, around everybody. And, um, and to the day she died, long after Stalin was exposed, by, by the Russians, by, by uh, who was that, Kusha. Uh, she still believed that Stalin was the great hero, the great man, and, and, and a wonderful human being. And uh, I later wrote a play about her called The Bad Friend. And, and, uh, uh, and it was a very political neighborhood, a political, this is the East Bronx, uh, before Robert Moses broke it up. With, with his West Bronx Expressway, and um, and there was a lot of left lefty 
politics going on. There was a, a left-wing party called the American Labor Party. Uh, there was a, 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 people were geared, uh, particularly, uh, particularly um, people of Jewish backgrounds uh, who came over on the boat themselves or who were first generation over here. And they identified, or oh, many of them, uh, with left-wing causes and left-wing uh, attitudes, that they were they were they were the early uh, whites who got who got involved in the civil rights movement before there was a civil rights movement, and um, and so in that very political era, one developed if that was uh, your, your your pension, a sense of politics, and then what really politicized me was the Hollywood blacklist coming along in the 1950s. And I saw these writers of films, and I was a big movie buff, and I saw writers of movies and actors in movies, people who, whose work I adored, or whose work I was even critical of, but who were suddenly out of work, and couldn't work, and, and because of their political beliefs all of which they denied, but <laughs> those were their beliefs. And uh, and that infuriated me and got me more and more angry and more and more politicized in terms of the direction of, of my work. Not intentionally, I just drifted into it. You just drifted into it? Well, yes, I felt that, that, that lots of, well, uh, it's important here to talk about uh, influences. Uh, I don't know how many, not many here are old enough to remember a journalist named I of Stone. Does anybody know that name? Oh, look at that. Well, uh, well, I of Stone started out at PM, a, 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 a radical newspaper, radical left newspaper, and then that became the star, and that went out of business, and then he started I of Stone's Weekly. Is he Stone's Weekly? Uh, introduced me to an America that I didn't know anything about. And uh, because at, at, at even with all the political stuff going on, uh, I basically believed that we, was, we were the good guys and we were all mixed up and we were trying to do better. And Stone started publishing stories based on his own research, his own homework, all of it his own, going through congressional records. Because uh, he had no staff, he, was, he, he did it all by himself. In which uh, he showed how the, the, the US government, and this was a democratic, uh, allegedly liberal government, was lying about nuclear testing and the harmful effects of nuclear fallout. And Stone just did it. The, the New York Times didn't, they hadn't figured out this story, and Stone, Stone figured it out and published it. Uh, and story after story after story, which made you, or made me, begin to question, the, uh, for the first time, um, the integrity of the state. I always thought it was just, we've got to get rid of the bad guys and put the good guys in and everything will be all right. But Stone showed me, by the, by the, the degree of his work that it was the essential uh, role of government to deceive, to hold back information, to make itself look good, and, and, and it had nothing to do with whether it was your side or the other side. They all did it. And it, it shaped in me a politics and an attitude to politics and an attitude to government that, uh, that stirred firm and developed uh, through the rest of my life. Question, it made me question what I, what I had never questioned before. It made me question the integrity of, of my own government, my own country, uh, and, uh, and everything else. And these were questions without Stone and an, another writer at the time, whose influence was very strong, and Murray Kempton, the New York Post. Stone and Kempton were, 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 were Mon Marx and Lenin. They, they shaped uh, my political sensibility and they're, they're still at the, at the core. Did it actually change your work, do you think? Did you feel your sensibilities, as your sensibilities were changing, did you uh, work change? 
It didn't change my sensibility. I think it formed or reformed my sensibility and made me ask questions I never thought of asking before and maybe look in places I never thought of looking before and maybe start reading. It's interesting. Uh, if, uh, first of all, I was always rotten at school. I, I, uh, um, and, and I thought it was, it went both ways. School was rotten to me. And that, 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 in the public school of the Bronx, in the, uh, in the East Bronx, in the Jewish neighborhood, we were taught in, in the very textbooks we were reading that the, um, that the Civil War had very little, nothing to do with slavery. <laughs> it was about states' rights. And the teacher brought justice. And one student got up and waved his hand, and it turned out to be me, uh, <laughs> questioning that assumption and, ask, and, and expecting a discussion about it. You know, I thought we would get into a, a discussion about what the Civil War was really about and talk about it. And instead, she told she essentially told me that I didn't know what I was talking about to shut up and sit down. And I found over and over again in my alleged education uh, in, a, in a nice Jewish brown school that the education wasn't indi education; it, it, it was indoctrination. It was being told what the rules were, so, so that you would inhabit the society that was that was ready for you, and you wouldn't mess things up. And um, and I realized even at that early age it was my role to mess things up. <laughs> so that I did, and that I still do. But it, it was obviously to your advantage not to go to college. Well, I tried to I tried to get into several colleges. I tried to get into NYU. They all turned me down because I was uh, uh, I'm dyslexic, and I could not understand what everybody else understood about uh, these applications you get. And I couldn't figure out uh, uh, the asked questions on them, and I, I didn't, I was perplexed. I was uh, totally nonplussed because I didn't know how to answer. And I made a mess out of all of this, and, uh, and thankfully I never, uh, I decided I, I was not going to go to college. I would go out and be a cartoonist to make a living and start my career. So, uh, and for a long time I felt very inferior to my friends and others. This is big government. <laughs> this is what we have to fight. You see how they're trying to shut me down. <laughs> you have every right to take this personally. <laughs> um, but you know, after, after, you know, you were... Oh, wait a minute. I thought we were going to have a conversation. You're just doing this Q&A. What about... Who are you? <laughs> I, I don't need an introduction to it. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. <laughs> uh, I'm the person who is put here to remind you that uh, you have to keep talking. <laughs> Bob, Lipsight and I have a Sunday morning breakfast uh, every Sunday morning except <laughs> since COVID. Uh, I mean, in my family. My wife has COVID, which is why she's not here tonight. My wife, Joan. Um, and um, and I get even less to say at breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we have scrambled eggs and toast. He makes the toast. I make the eggs. We have coffee. I make the coffee. I do all the hard work, and then we sit down and we talk for two and a half, three hours, solve everything, and then he goes home and I take a nap. <laughs> and we've done this every Sunday for years. And, that, and that's why everything is solved. <laughs> I mean, you know how much better it all is. Things have gotten a lot better. <laughs> what, what I don't understand here is... Yes, there's a lot you don't understand. <laughs> I've been meaning to talk to you about that. <laughs> well, 
you know, during the water, the, you began to kind of move into other areas. Um, writing plays, writing screenplays, writing, actually writing more, then on to novels, um, wonderful memoir, which was basically trashing his mother. <laughs> Why are you so hard on your mother? <laughs> <laughs> if you knew my mother. <laughs> but um, so in in the in this other work, I mean, there was it was it was more in the other work. One of the things that I like best in all your work is the film Carnal Knowledge. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Which, you know, if, if anything was a early warning of the Me Too generation, uh, it was it was Carnal Knowledge. What was in your mind? You, you started that. That was started as a play. Am I right? Well, it, it was. It, it was a, for some. Uh, since all of my younger years, my, you know, from adolescence to late adolescence to young manhood, was all about me and women and having sex and finding a way to get sex. And watching other men get sex, and I couldn't get sex, or other all the boys get sex, and uh, and then hanging out with guys as they talked about sex, and um, and then getting involved with Playboy magazine back in the late, the uh, late fifties and early sixties, and being in Chicago when the magazine was headquartered there, um, and hanging around with Hefner and that crew. Um, I developed uh, a sense of something that I wanted to write about and I didn't know how I was going to address it. And I knew it couldn't, it, it was too complicated to, 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 uh, to address in my weekly voice cartoon. And God knows Playboy was a good one. But it was the sense that heterosexual men didn't like women. They like pussy, and that that they they wanted they, they, that women were connected to what they needed. But what really heterosexual men liked to do was get laid, go to a bar, and talk to the guys about it, and share all of that with the men. The real good time they had was talking about what they had done, and then ran from as soon as it was over. They, 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 while the woman wanted to have a discussion about a relationship. God forbid they didn't want anything close to a relationship. They just wanted to go and talk to their buddies. And uh, and that's that's where the real sex was happening among these guys talking about it. And the it was to these women they had just abandoned. So I thought that was an interesting idea and I was trying to figure out a way of how of what to do with it. Obviously, it couldn't be a voice cartoon, and obviously, it couldn't be a cartoon that was before the graphic novel, or I might have thought of doing it in that form. And then I took a trip to London, and I saw a, 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 an Olivier produced and starred in version of Strindberg's play, The Dance of Death, which is about as misogynistic a piece of writing as you can possibly imagine. And as I watched this production, which was a brilliant production, lightning hit me and I said, this is, I, 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 the, the rage and hatred expressed in this play is what I have to find and what I have to do. And, and in, in the play I write, it has, it has to have this kind of anger. And um, so it was a, it was the accident of seeing Olivier's production of Dance of Death uh, and, and, it, and, and then picking up the Strindberg play and reading it over and over again that, and, and, uh, that, that gave me um, a way of writing what I wanted to write. And, um, and I, I knew it, it couldn't be in any other form than the dramatic form. What else could it be? So I, uh, I, you know, I, I tried writing novels, and I was terrible at description and 
long narrative and all of that to listen to me, but dialogue I could do. And I love the dialogue and I love doing character. So carnal knowledge grew out of that. Um, uh, I had good luck just previously with Alan Arkin who had directed two of my play, two of my plays and I sent it to him and he didn't get it at all. So I sent it to Mike Nichols who had rejected Little Murders when I wrote that, my first play. And Mike said, I want to do it but it's not a play, it's a movie and that's how we got Carnal Knowledge on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Something I've always wondered. How about my out of cartooning because so much more that you wanted to say that you really couldn't say uh, in cartoons. Well, I, they, were, they were, you could say an awful lot in cartoons, and um, but some of the more nuanced cartoons aren't necessarily gifted at nuance. Uh, not mine, and not any of the people who I thought of as masters. Uh, they're, they're more bold. And uh, there were essay points I wanted to make. Um, and it seemed to me the dramatic form, since I wasn't a novelist, if I was, I could have written a novel, but since uh, the but dramatic form was my way of, of, of expressing that. And I love theater. Uh, I loved writing dialogue. I loved making characters and scenes, and uh, and writing and rewriting and rewriting, and making sure that I wasn't allowing my editorial point of view to take over. The, 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 it all had to happen through the characters. It, it couldn't be the writer's overview directing the play. And so learning how to do that, it's a hard thing to learn how to do because one's authorial heavy hand is out, is out there waiting to take over and, and, uh, and make your point. And, um, but when you make your point in a heavy handed way, you're not making it to the audience. But I learned my cartoons really well because I was saying controversial things is that if I editorialized my real language, I wasn't going to get any. So I formed uh, an approach of uh, innocent conversation, starting out talking to the reader in one character or two characters, in either a monologue facing the audience or a dialogue between two people. And it moves slowly into the subject, and slowly, more slowly, until I trap, or my design is to trap the reader before, uh, uh, in, in the web I've created, before he or she has a chance to, to say, oh, oh, I don't want to take, I don't want to do this, and before they can get out of it, and then I hit them with the punchline, and when it's too late for them to escape, <laughs> and that was that was basically what I taught myself to do over the. Just make it all very innocent. Make it look like nothing is happening. Make the drawings very inactive and, and, and almost passive. Let it, let it just uh, the little changes here and there. And then hit them in the gut. And you did that. It was almost always a surprise at the end. Yeah. You know, I think mean, after a while, I mean, you were being read, certainly in my newsroom, being read avidly. Uh, and then we became you know, inured to the fact that but he is going to sneak up on us and, and hit us over the back of the head. Um, I was wondering, we, we uh, you know, started eating breakfast around the time um, that Trump <laughs> started eating at lunch on him. Uh, but we, we started, and I, I kind of wondered, we never really got to that. Um, has that been in your time? I mean, well, for starters, as a, as a, by this time you were not so much of a cartoonist anymore, but as a cartoonist, when he first appeared, is the first thought, oh, this is going to be juicy. <laughs> did, what, what was your first reaction as a, 
as a cartoonist and a satirist when this version of Trump appeared. <coughs> well, I never did Trump. I mean, I, I, I was uh, actually Gary Trudeau in Doonesbury was way ahead of me uh, in sizing up Trump and doing uh, extraordinarily prescient work on Trump, which if you read years later, uh, he had uh, he had Trump right right from the get go, right at the beginning, uh, and uh, uh, and it, it stands up. It's still extraordinary stuff. But um, I um, I just thought as Trump is this buffoonish, uh, awful, awful. You know. I mean, well, uh, all of the things about it were transparent from the beginning, the racism, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the authoritarian style, all of that. But I didn't take him seriously. Or, 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 I mean, the notion that he would uh, one day be president, I think, I think Trudeau sensed something about this long before I did, to his credit. Well, you did some, uh, some Trump stuff for the tablet. And you were, um, and you were killed. Uh, I mean, so obviously yeah, you were. Yeah, but that was that was after Trump was already president. Right. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, obviously yeah. I mean, you were up to something. I mean, once he was president and and the style was in place, that mm -hmm. was easy. That was easy. That was easy. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything with the tablet except criticize Israel. Right. So that was just, <laughs> well, that and, fed into Trump. And 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 that got into Trump. Yes. Yeah. Which is. Why I finally stopped. Uh, it was a do very. You, do you ever, do you ever think that uh, if there was a venue for you right now, that it would be fun to recapitulate those days? You know that. Recapitulate what? Recapitulate, um, you know that the the kind of work you were doing in those days now. I don't think. No, because I'm not. I'm not that person anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Look at me. <laughs> I'm a very old, deaf fart. And, and, uh, You're not that deaf. <laughs> Would you repeat that, please? <laughs> and, and, and I am you know, I'm conscious virtually every minute of the day. And I comment on, on, on it to myself as I move across You talk the about it incessantly. What's that? You talk about being old incessantly. Well, I am old incessantly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, because I'm aware of, of how ridiculous it is. I mean, how uh, tying my shoes is a major enterprise. How I get my pants on wrong. I mean, things that you never think of when you're younger. All of the things that were automatic now are intellectual exercises. <laughs> putting on your socks, putting on your shoes, getting out of bed. It's all, uh, 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 it all becomes, how interesting, I wonder how, I wonder if there's a way of doing this. <laughs> Let's see, do I put the left foot out first or the right foot out first? Uh, how do I avoid falling on my face? How, you know, I mean, just, just, so it's, uh, so this, the younger part of me, the obser the constant observer, who's always looking uh, curiously at this old man who is his body and thinking, well, how is he going to get through this day? <laughs> and it, uh, and because I'm a satirist, I find that not sad, but funny. <laughs> well, is there any upside to this thing? <laughs> is there any, I, I didn't hear you. Is there any, well, shut up and listen. Is there any upside to being old and infirm and crotchety and a pop? <laughs> well, the upside is this. I'm in the happiest relationship I've ever had in my life. I'm married to a wonderful woman. Uh, I am having a very good time with my, uh, 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 living out here has been a blessing, uh, and, and knowing, making the friends I have, uh, the, the, 
the remarkable services of the senior center uh, uh, to older people uh, has ch uh, changed our lives. And uh, it's, uh, there are endless good things that, you know, that I'm aware of. And uh, I mean, I, I don't, when I was younger, I was depressed all of the time, much of the time. When everything was going very well for me, I'd get depressed and full of self-pity and self-hatred. And now uh, I find when things don't work out that it, it, it turns into a joke for me. <coughs> well, these are all external things that you've been talking about. What makes you think they're external? <laughs> Let's talk about internal things. I mean, for, I mean, we're all much, much younger than you are. <laughs> and we can all tie our shoes. <laughs> so what, what can you tell us? You're younger than I? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Lois, are you there? I'm Lois. Here. And where, how old is he? Uh, he's 42. <laughs> well, I've had a hard life. <laughs> I guess he. I, I, uh, well, it's I, very. I don't know what I must say is you look very old for forty two. It's obvious. It's obvious to all of us that he's too much for me. And I think this would be a very good time for you younger people to help out. We're open for questions. No, we're not. <laughs> I am. Does any of you have any questions for Bob? What's your name? <laughs> you know, we've got four or five investigative reporters that just sitting in front of us. Uh, and if they don't come up Bob. with some Oh, there's Bob, our, the star Bob. of stage the and screen. Reverend. Yeah, the Reverend. Bob, will you ask him, this is a question for you, will you ask him what he's doing next work-wise? What did, you, what did you say? Again? Yeah. Huh? I didn't hear. It. Say it again. Would you ask him what he's going to do? Who's him? You. Yeah. I'm asking Bob the question, and he has to ask it to you. Well, you know, when you were prancing around on the stage last week, you had you didn't you didn't have to go around to ask. <laughs> ask you said the question. I asked a question for Bob, so I gave you the question, Bob. That's it. Ask him yourself. Bob, would you answer his question? <laughs> He's a noted thespian. He can ask his own question. You wanna, do you wanna, what are you going to do? Do you want to rephrase that question into a language we understand? <laughs> what are you doing next? What's the, what are you doing? Are you working on anything? <laughs> yeah, what he, what he wants to know, yeah, I'll answer the question. Actually, he is. And he is at his desk every single day. It's amazing. Uh, He's finished two very funny children's books, uh, a very large noir, and um, I don't know what he's starting on next. War and Peace. <laughs> well, you better get going. You'll only, you'll only be able to do war. <laughs> Is there another more coherent question? <laughs> yeah, oh yes. Were oh. you pointing at him to make yes, a question? He's, he's first. He, he he first. He's first. Please. We have a question indicator. Right. <laughs> you ask a question. No, you ask it. What about your life allowed you to recognize that was such a I heard little, something about what about my wife but what, about, <laughs> what about your what about your life allowed you to recognize a kind of misogyny that was so normative Wait, just before you wrote uh, carnal knowledge yeah uh, how, what was going on in your life at, up to that time that made you uh, 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 your mind available to understand the misogyny around you? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, the, uh, here is an interesting aspect of one such as myself who's always thought of 
of myself is so insightful that I would do something, write a piece of work or create a piece of work, whatever the form it was in, thinking that I can't have this in any way autobiographical. Uh, it has to be something that the ordinary or great middle class reader who is my audience will understand and identify with. So it can't be personal, it can't be about me, it can't be uh, at all about me. I have to siphon all that stuff out. And then I would think I've done all of that. And then years later, I pick up a collection of my cartoons that had been published 20 years earlier or 30 years earlier, and read it, look it over, and I think, oh my god, <laughs> it's a fucking confession. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, would have had no idea at the time, none. So, uh, our ability to fool ourselves, or lie to ourselves, or, you know, or, uh, uh, or hide things, is, is endless. Which makes us um, interestingly creative and also quite dangerous. I, I think you kind of dodged a very interesting yeah. question, uh, which is really, I mean, were you one of those bystander people who were, was watching everybody else? Did you have other sensitivity pathways that you know the jocks didn't have. I mean, you know, how were you able to understand and focus uh, on the sexuality, the, the faux sexuality of men? Well, I, I think I already answered that. It was the years of um, dealing with uh, Playboy when primarily in Chicago, and um, and when I'd go to Chicago, I was in Ch Chicago's a wonderful city, and and, um, and at the time that Playboy was at its most popular in Chicago, there was um, just establishing itself Second City in Chicago, and other uh, uh, experimental theaters, uh, Steppenwolf, and uh, uh, Chicago is much more interesting theater town than New York ever has been. I mean, when New York gets a good play, it often comes from Chicago. And and um, and I didn't realize that or understand that until I started spending time in Chicago and and, and becoming part of that scene to the extent I could during the period of time I was in there. And I was in there a lot. I. Uh, during the conspiracy trial of, uh, 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 in, I guess it was 1969, uh, I would fly back and forth to Chicago to do trial drawings of the courtroom and did a book on it called Pictures Out of Prosecution. Uh, and, uh, and, and I got, uh, and made some wonderful friends. Studs Turkle was a good friend. It was a great, great man and a sweetheart. And there were so many others. It, it, it was a lovely, lovely city uh, to have as, as my second city. That, that, that was pretty cool. Uh, you totally <laughs> deflected that question. <laughs> so we're, we're left with the, with the obvious idea that it was Hugh Hefner who made him well, what was the, what was the question? <laughs> Let, let's see if I can deflect it in a better way. What, what, what was your question? Well, I mean, you're going to have to dig for this one. I, I, you're, a noisy, you're a nosy son of a bitch. What, what? <laughs> That's why I did the big The point is that you had something. Now, maybe you're unaware of it. Maybe you don't know. Maybe we're asking. I the, unaware. We're asking the wrong person. <laughs> but there's something within you, uh, whether it was being this, you know, uh, scared, spindly little kid <laughs> in the Bronx who was a watcher. Uh, I don't know the sensitivity of an artist, but you understood what was going on while other people didn't. I mean, uh, carnal knowledge was brilliant. And certainly brilliant in his presence uh, of, uh, of kind of the, the male mystique. 
Okay, I, I, I understand the question. It was the accident of falling in love in the public library, uh, which was a few blocks from our house, falling in love with novels that I knew nothing about. And I would just go to the library and see something with an attractive jacket and pick it up and start reading. And often as not, I get trapped by the first paragraph and then take the book home. And I discovered that this book, which I knew nothing about, and this author, who well, I may have heard of, but knew little about, would change my life. And would make me start thinking thoughts about relationships, about people, about life, and, you know, about things that, before I picked up the book by accident, I had no idea I had any interest in. So it was really uh, the, the, the luck of the draw, finding books that spoke to me because I had no education, I had no schooling, I had to kind of discover my own way to an education. And it came through the accommodation of what I got at the public library, and then uh, the, the local radio station in the city, WNYC, would have lectures, and I would listen to those. So I, I, I think there was a scattershot way of learning which, uh, got me to learn more in the direction I wanted to go than any uh, university might have taken. Well, thank you. That, the, I got in the plug for libraries. Yes, absolutely. It's the accident of what you look at, of what you pick up, for no particular reason. It's got an interesting jacket. Or I think I've heard of this author's name before. Or yeah, and, and I'll just look at the first page. Wait a minute, this is interesting. What's going on here? And then you find yourself uh, involved in this other world. And my God, when a book grabs you and holds you, it, 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 and it's done this many times. It changes, it changes one's life. Uh, you, you, because uh, you. On one level, you're leading your own life, and you're doing all of the stuff you normally do. And on another level, you're inside that book, wanting to go back to it, wondering what the characters are doing, what's going to happen, uh, what it, this means, and does that mean, and this, is this going to... to you know, so, uh, you know, from... Uh, and particularly, you know, I felt madly in love with the Russians, uh, you know, I, I, I think... War and Peace is the greatest piece of reading I've ever done in my life and, 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 uh, and changed my life. Uh, and, uh, well, I never really liked Anna Karenina. And, and uh, uh, but reading, the, the, the discovery, the stumbling into your own life, but it's taking place in the 18th century, in the 19th century, in, and how uh, in a different society from yours, in, in every possible way, and, and, and in a different culture in every possible way, and in a different class. Uh, because I came from the shtetl class, <laughs> and these were people who you know, had uh, nobility and, and, and money, and it didn't really matter because they were talking to me, and I was talking back to them. And we had conversations. It's, it's remarkable. And that's the, the, the role of you know, literature in a serious way in all of our lives. You know, it, 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 uh, it's what truly educates us and shapes us as opposed to um, what that thing is called, that's, uh, what, what's it called, or teaching. <laughs> Tom, did you have your hand up, or are you just, uh, no, 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 Tom, you, you don't get to pick people. <laughs> <laughs> is your hand uh, up? Yeah, yeah, I have my hand up. Yeah. So, do you, um, is it possible for political cartoons to have the same amount of power now in the age of social media? So, does a political cartoonist have the same power that you and Herblock and those guys did in this time of social media. 
I don't know about social media because I, I don't do social media. I mean, I, I, I'm a, I'm, I am now and have always been an electronic fool. When I turn on a computer, something goes wrong. <laughs> and and um, I'm dyslexic and, and, and I just can't make any of this stuff work. So, uh, you know, I mean, I don't do Facebook. I don't do any, I, I, I wouldn't know how to do it. And, um, and uh, so, uh, I forgot the question. Well, no, it's, it's not if you, you don't know. I mean, uh, the answer is I don't know. Thank yeah, you. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what is your name again? <laughs> if, if indeed somebody put you on uh, social media, if, if you were on Facebook, if you were doing cartoons, would you have the power that you had when a very a much smaller audience of us was reading you in the village voice? I think it's a different readership today. It's a different kind of audience. Um, Why? I, I, think, I, think, I, I think people... I, mean, I, I, I think, as I, I said earlier, because of digitalization, the fragmentation uh, of our, our entire society on every level makes it unlike, less likely, um, except in terms of mass entertainment like uh, music and the other forms that transcend everything else, um, to catch a, 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 a huge and sizable audience as one once was able. To. I wonder. I mean, uh, you I think one very you would. important. I'm glad you would. <laughs> <laughs> you became very uh, much of a, a, a acclaimed and powerful voice uh, for the voice, which is a very small niche, uh, a Greenwich Village newspaper. You know, uh, young people, commies. Uh, so on and so Thank forth. you very much. Yes. Um, so if you could have made that kind of impact in, in that narrow place, the question is, God knows uh, I, I if made you that were on Facebook. I made that impact for one very simple reason. It was post Joe McCarthy, post Dwight Eisenhower, post... Uh, The entire American society was under wraps and felt under wraps. And I started talking as if there were no wraps in my cartoons and saying things that people said quietly to each other, but I was saying them in print. And it came as such a startling relief. Oh my God, did you hear? This guy is saying what I was just talking about last week. All I did was report the conversations I heard around me and, 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 and the conversations I had with friends or, 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 or casual people who were not friends, but I, uh, on, on serious and dangerous subjects but, and, and turning them into humor and turning them into um, A kind of critical form that um, that didn't attack the reader for thinking the wrong way, but basically made the reader feel somebody out there understands me, somebody out there knows me. I think anybody. I mean, which is you pick up a good book or you see a good play or you or or, 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 or a movie, uh, uh, and the ability to identify is still a grit the ability to say that's me up there uh, or I feel that way and, and, and then it takes you beyond just your feelings and then informs you of something that perhaps you weren't ready to learn yet and, and doors open I mean I can't tell you how many times I'd go to see a play one in particular uh, uh, the English production were outside by Peter Brooks did and I went home and I started drinking and sitting there and thinking and trying to figure out what the hell I just seen. And uh, 
realized uh, after an hour or two that I had seen a remarkable work of art that had just changed my life and and, um, and was staggered. You know, that th those are experiences that art can do to you that don't happen very often in your life, and when they do, wow. Well, when you see an actor, a performance on stage, that um, uh, I once, it was a, a play, I think it was called The Monk in the Country, based on uh, uh, Tegenio. I think it was Tegenio. But it starred Alan Bates and Frank Langella. And uh, both of them were extraordinary. But at the near the final, the finale of the play, Alan Bates stands on stage uh, and just talks to the audience. And he doesn't act. He just sits there conversationally addressing the audience. I have no memory at all of what he said. But as he talks in this 10 or 12 minute monologue, uh, I sat there realizing that I was witnessing some kind of miracle mm -hmm. because uh, everybody in that audience disappeared and it was Alan Bates and me. Mm -hmm. And he was having this conversation with Jules alone. And it was changing my life. And I was also aware that I was in the theater and the people were all around me, but this other reality was happening at the same time. And it was, and I, I thought, this is why I go to plays and mm -hmm. how seldom it happens. But when it does happen, it is the most moving and profound ex personal experience imaginable. And, and that is what I think real theater is as opposed to the kind of shit we have today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Gary. Hi. Uh, I've had the pleasure of your company on several occasions and always enjoyed it one story or another. And you I talk about a lot of plays. <laughs> and I remember in some of them you would regale myself and others with stories of the summers you rented a home on Fire Island. This would have been in the late 50s and early 60s. And during those summers, you, at least this is the way you told it, you cavorted around with Philip Roth and got into all kinds of mischief and so forth. Could you talk a little bit about that? About Fly Around? Philip Roth. He wants to dish Philip Roth. I don't remember Philip being on Fly Island. Uh, uh, Alexander King, who was a, a friend of mine, and re some of you, the older ones will remember from uh, Jack Parr show, uh, was a friend of mine, and he was an extraordinary man. Uh, he was there. I, uh, P.J. Friedman was on fire. Uh, I couldn't stand Bruce because he was built like a muscle man. I mean, he was just extraordinary. I love this writing, but I hate it to look at it. <laughs> it made me ashamed of myself. And, and um, I don't think Philip uh, was a Fire Islander. It, it's uh, Philip um, went up for the first time, to, was, was up on Martha's Vineyard with me for the first time. Bob Brewstein, who was had been a theater critic for the uh, uh, New Republic and then became head of the Yale Drama School uh, and was a mutual friend of Roth's and mine. Uh, invited us up to the vineyard one weekend. We had never been there. And uh, uh, that was the weekend that um, there's a local beach uh, near, near, near Brewstein's house called Lambert's Cove Beach. And we go there and hang out. And one day, I mean, second or third day there, Roth starts sprinting, standing in the water, up knee deep. All of us are. And he suddenly starts talk about starts talking about jerking off, <laughs> and which nobody ever talked about. And it's 
and we are amazed at what he's saying, and we are screaming with laughter. Uh, neither one of us can stand up. We're falling in the water. We're getting up and falling and getting up and falling. And Philip is going on and on and on and on. And of course, that was the beginning of Portnoy. Uh, this was a dry run. <laughs> the unacknowledged influence in all of this, uh, Philip never could have written Portnoy without Letty Bruce preceding him with his, with the night, his nightclub act, which got him into jail. I could never have written Cardinal Knowledge without Letty. I mean, that Lenny Bruce was extraordinary influence on so much of the culture that happened in the next 15 or 20, 25 years. Uh, he was a remarkable mind, a remarkable man. But that, that's my wall story. Robert? I want to enroll, uh, you, how long have you been on Shelter Island? What do you like and love about it? And is it true that you might be leaving it? Uh, You're not on Shelter Island? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's one of the, th the first thing I loved about Shelter Island is it's not the mainland. <laughs> it's not the Hamptons, and uh, and it's a different vibe and a different feeling about it. And is, and and there is a, a a level of gentleness uh, and openness. Uh, on its best level, that uh, is hard to find or is covered up elsewhere. And I mean, there's much about Sag Harbor I'm crazy about. And I've worked at Bay Street Theater, and I love that, that there, and I, I, I love the American Hotel, and I love other the, uh, the, the, the page, and, you know, but, but uh, there is, uh, but nothing is, is, is like Vine Street. And, um, <laughs> And I, there is a, and then uh, being here enabled me to develop my friendship with, what's your name again, Sonny? <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old, I don't remember. Yeah, but but um, one of the great friendships of my life came about because I moved here and there was Lipside. And uh, it's something that, that means more to me than I can say because uh, we are, uh, uh, we have become a part of each other's consciousness and, uh, and, and enrich each other in, in, in this way. Uh, don't tell his wife. Those of you are not listening to this. And, and, and uh, uh, Thanks, Jules, but that was a two part question. <laughs> What's the other part? The other part was that uh, Robert Coolish heard somewhere maybe he reads a newspaper, um, <laughs> that you might be leaving the island. I Why? might be leaving, yes, that's true. I might, was that Robert Coleridge? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I know you. <laughs> you used to know me. <laughs> so why are you a stranger? Uh, I have... Uh, over the last, uh, since mid-May, uh, I've been out of the hospital two or three times. I stopped breathing for a while, and I had to be revived. Uh, I have, uh, in part, I have COPD, and, and, the, and because of, we're living on the water's edge, uh, the humidity, Proximity to water turns out to operate against uh, my best breathing. We went out, my wife and I, John, uh, upstate, uh, high in the mountains. Uh, it's about an hour out of uh, uh, Cooperstown, and there's a house uh, with a view of Skyler Lake, and that was for sale. And suddenly I could breathe in a way I hadn't in 30 or 40 years. And it's the mountain air and, 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 and 
limitation that suddenly makes it possible to live in a way that I haven't been able to live in, in, in a long time. So that is what uh, is, is, is making us move. Uh, but I guess it's painful because I will miss so much of uh, what should be missed. And, uh, and even you. So, uh, <laughs> Eggs on Zoom are hard. Yeah. So we, we're gonna, we, we, we are going to do a lot of, it's a big house, we're going to invite a lot of friends in the mall suite, and and, um, and we'll do a lot of Zooming. Um, we're almost out of time. Yeah? yeah. You said something about your writing for children. What's that? Ann Banks would like to know about your writing for children. Uh, Bark George. I, uh, for some re insane reason, at the age of 93 and a half, I'm still writing books very happily for five, six, seven, eight year olds. Uh, and, uh, and having a very good time doing it. But I think that's probably the age I never left. <laughs> that's, that, that may be the reason. It's it's it's. Uh, I blame it all on a cultivated lack of maturity. Roz. Hello. Uh, yes, um, Jules. Uh, thank you for for this and Bob. Um, don't you think there's some hope for the future of digitization in terms of touch? and being in touch with others when you're talking about Zooming with us, uh, far, far away from another state. I would argue that sometimes you can be closer to people. Uh, I know I have been online at times more than when our bodies are even, our bodies can actually get in the way of that. So I think there's some wondrous things about this new time. And I, I wonder if you, if you see any of that potential there. I think that uh, Roz is alluding to the possibility of you becoming a uh, technological wizard and uh, <laughs> using online. Roz, you'll have to come take charge of that. <laughs> uh, if, if you set, set something up, maybe it would work. We have time for one more question. Uh, we're being waved away. No more. says this is what you're going to do and now and, and I, for me look I never did sports uh, I have uh, being, being dyslexic I couldn't uh, if I thought a ball was over here it was over there so I think uh, that, that uh, there was so much that uh, I couldn't do that uh, that I could do on paper and so I feel a sense of invincibility on paper, which means you screw up all the time, and and you and you keep screwing up until you get it right. I mean, one of the uh, I taught for many years uh, at uh, Stony Brook Southampton when it was beginning when it was still just Southampton South Southampton College, and I taught it with Roger Rosenblatt. Great professor and great writer. Uh, we're starting a program at the college, and when the voice fired me, he called me up on the phone. We were casual friends, and he said, "I'm not interested in your self-pity. I just <laughs> want to know uh, what your insurance situation is." And this was in the spring of the year, and I said, "At the end of the year, I don't have any health uh, 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 insurance." And he said, well, I'm starting a writing program out here. And we pay Bob but 
well, you and your family will be fully covered and you're going to come out here and teach. And I said, what do, you, what do I teach? He said, anything you want. I said, how often? He said, how often that you, uh, 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 you want? I said, well, when? He said, you're beginning to bore me if he hung up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's how I got out to this area. And it, 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 uh, it changed my life. It changed my career. Uh, it gave me my present wife and my last wife and my happiest experience uh, in, in marriage. And, uh, and uh, even the horn of <laughs> and um, and uh, living here has been a, a, a surreal experience because it was one that leading to another event in the event. And uh, I was, it was almost as if I was following uh, with no real intellectual sense, a magical trail that took me here and took me there and took me there, and I'm still following it, and I will continue to follow it.